Welcome to Span Reads, not your typical rereads podcast, a 17 shard series where we reread Brandon Sanderson's works and are giant nerds about it. Unlike the traditional reread style, we won't be going through each book chapter by chapter, but instead looking at different themes within the series. We will be doing three episodes reactions and retrospectives, characters' relationships, and then a third episode on lore. Unlike our Cosmere rereads, we will be doing full spoilers for these episodes, particularly for the first book, as the setup and pacing for this series has led to a lot more comparing and contrasting during the previous Span episodes. As such, this is our warning to viewers and listeners that there will be full spoilers for all Skyward's novels, excluding Defiant, and the Skyward Flight novel novellas from this point forward. Today, we are talking about Skyward, the first book in the Skyward series. Joining me is Ian. Hey, I'm your writer. Jesse. Hello, I'm Lady Lameness. Eric. Hey, I'm Cass. And I'm Mish, Michelle, or First Rainbow Rose. So, first episode is Retrospectives and Recaps. For a recap, you can click on the link to Jesse's video. So, does anybody have any thoughts to start us off? This book is good. This great. This book it, is very good. It is. Oh. I finished it and immediately wanted to launch into the rest of them. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> explicit silence. <laughs> um, rereading, I figured out I had not reread this book since it came out. Same. Which has yeah. been a little bit, which is weird to think about as like, this is still Brandon's new series in my head. Yeah. This, this book is very special to me because Jess and I got together about a day after uh, the Skyward San Francisco signing. So it, basically the duration that Skyward's been in existence is the length of our relationship. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's been a bit, actually. But it doesn't really feel like it's been that long, no. which is no. crazy. It might be in part because it's still an ongoing series as well. Mm. COVID doesn't help for time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a thing that happened. I really liked this book uh, when I first read it. Mm. I think on a reread, though I still think it's very good, I think I like it a bit less than I remembered. Not much, but a little bit less. Uh, I think... Uh, in my brain, I remembered a lot of like the stress of combat and just how I felt during that. And that, that's definitely there. But uh, it's it's very why <laughs> like there's a, there's a lot of why elements in this. I'm like, oh, right. That is in there. And that, that is less my thing. Uh, but it still think it's Brandon's best non Cosmere stuff. Mm. Yeah, I kind of had. A little bit of the opposite in that rereading this book reminded me why it was my favorite Brandon book for so long. And really, if it wasn't for Tress, the book that came out this year, it still would be, like I think. Everything that I love about this book is still there, but because of my feelings towards the rest of the series now, a lot of it's really tinged in a different light than when I first read it. And a lot of the rereads I did um, previous to this one were before Starsight came out or like were when Starsight came, had just come out as well. So there's just like the evolution of my feelings towards the series as a whole have really changed how I see this book by itself, but I can still see everything I saw in the book that I saw initially that really made me like fall in love with it. I found myself cringing a little bit more at Spence's over the topness than I might have, than I had in previous sure. reads. And mm -hmm. I'm glad that she grows out of that to an extent. Mm -hmm. I found it a bit easier to deal with because I knew that she grew out of it. I remember really mm. struggling with that the first time. And the number of people who have like said that the first time they're reading it, they're like, I don't know if I can deal with Spencer. It's like, it's okay. She gets better. <laughs> that, 
that is true. I think on my first read, I did have some trouble until like about the halfway point of the book. Uh, and then then like I was definitely into it. Like once once the people in Skyward Flight start dying, she's like, oh, oh, crap. Uh, then yeah. then it got really real. And also the the line where Mbot where Mbot's doing the same thing. It's like, I sound like that. Oh, no, I sound like that. It's like, <laughs> that's, that's good. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. one of the greatest points in the book. I will say, like, my feelings on this book also were a little different because I feel like Jesse and I have spoken before about, like, each of us got different expectations from Skyward mm. going into the future books. And whereas I liked the direction the books, like she not so much and so it's like going back to this book where it's like the seeds of like what i really enjoy in the future books are here but they are very minimal oh really what do you mean well it's because it's like i like alien stuff and i like cool cytonic stuff ah yeah not yeah really an emphasis like th like they're like cool mysteries but like brandon doesn't necessarily like shine a light on them totally so, like either like you think they're cool like and you're happy with the direction the series goes or it's like that wasn't the part of the book that vibed with you and you're mm. like yeah yeah no i really liked how brandon eased us into the cytonic stuff oh, mm -hmm. like i thought that was very yeah. easy and like we finally get grand grand talking about like the engines and like really late in the book <laughs> like it's really late yeah. uh there it's like and that's like one of my favorite scenes like in the series is like her talking about like her mother as the soul of the engines and i'm like this is what i love this is great yeah you know it it's really fun because i remember re when i first read it i remember seeing you know doom's log popped up and doom slug popped up and i was like from the beginning of the series i was like they are teleporting doom ah, slug is yeah. teleporting and being mm. able and being able to be right about that from the beginning was a great feeling yeah because she doesn't do it that much in the book really yeah it's like, like, a, like it twice like, it's not confirmed in this book no not at all no it's no. not no it's there's some very subtle foreshadowing that's put mm -hmm. into this book for later things. Uh, like Doomslug is definitely one of them. Uh, Jorgen being a Cytonic is another one. And I was always really pleased that I was able to pick up on that one. Um, yeah. And I think there was something else, but I can't remember off the top of my head. Like the stuff with the eyes, like the- Oh man, yeah. The, mm -hmm. Oh, the, the d added Delvar training facility as the shipyard's going mm -hmm. down. It's like, ah, mm -hmm. mm, with the tunnels. Mm, yes, indeed. Yep. Also, just like the Cytonic hyperdrive, um, the first time I, I read it, I, I did so with like physical book, but I was listening to it as an audiobook this time. And I don't know if it's just because I know the series more now, but every time they said Cytonic hyperdrive, like, not online it just stood out so much more <laughs> when someone says it than when you read it <laughs> like yeah. what's that thing i don't know those words hmm. yep nope it definitely stands out as you're clearly supposed to go hmm that's weird i wonder what that is yeah like the first time i read it it it's like oh yeah you know destructors this is cytonic stuff because i honestly had totally forgotten that that was a thing in Defending Elysium the first time I read Skyward. And it's like, I had not read Def Defending Elysium beforehand. Because, ah. like, we knew, like, before it came out that it was, like, in continuity with, like, a short story he had yes. written. Correct. But we didn't know if it, that was Defending Elysium or Firstborn. Yeah, mm, yes, yeah. that's true. Yes, yes. Um, with neither of which I had read. And then I finished and I was talking to you, Eric, and you're like, yeah, it's Defending Elysium. Go read that. Okay. Yeah. And that I did. I'm yeah. Like, okay. Okay. Now things are making sense. Yeah. Yeah. Does Defending Elysium actually use the word cytonic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the capitalization isn't consistent either with this series. So that's <laughs> fun. But to be fair, Brandon wrote it in like early 2000s. So that he can be 
forgiven <laughs> for not thinking about the later series he'd write 20 years later. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, there are people picking up on the uh, Rytelium yep. as well when yep. they're monitoring Spencer's brain. For Jason Wright in Defense of Elysium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thinking about the magic stuff, uh, and we'll do an episode talking about the what little magic and stuff we got. Uh, this This book really is very grounded and not very magical all things considered yeah yes like i i thought spensa used the oh Sp- i i can hear the other krell uh their cytonic stuff way earlier but like she absolutely didn't like it, it was very mm-hmm. slow she's just like man this helmet what, what's going on with this helmet and just very slow burn which i really like the defect yeah the yeah. defect yeah 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 mm-hmm. It, though that that's not the magic stuff is not what I have a problem with in the later books. <laughs> Part of like the, I hesitate to say hesitate to say the issue. I think this book versus the later books, they're operating on like different orders of magnitude in terms of what you know. This book is so constrained in like the human perspective of a group of humans that have lost their history and don't actually know what's going yeah. on mm-hmm. versus like star sight the novellas and um cytonic like you do learn things through the course of those novellas but like the jumps in your knowledge are much smaller compared to like this book and those books mm. that makes sense so that like, makes a lot of sense yeah so like a lot of like the tone of like not knowing like what's going on He's kind of lost once you know even a little bit more. It's a very interesting way of putting it, um, because something that really jumped out to me <clears throat> with this reread was that this is the book where we get the most about defiant culture and mm-hmm. about who they are as a people beyond the small group in the DDF that we follow. Mm-hmm. And that just doesn't really continue from yeah. at least my memory in the other books so it it's just it is interesting that like the other books we get such an expansion of the world but if anything we kind of lose a lot of the closeness we get to this society that we have in the first book and like that is partially because like star sight spencer's somewhere else and other things and Mm -hmm. that's not the point of the book but i think like that's also part of the expectation discrepancies that happen is that like this book can come across as like okay we're trying to show this group of people this culture growing into the universe and then that's not really what happens afterwards yeah and it's like it's like the breadth of the series like dramatically in- increased but we lost some of the depth as part of that yeah because yeah. like yeah. there's a whole thing about like, a lot of recent developments are like the last like since the first battle of Volta. it's like before that like everybody was in isolated clans and like yeah. they didn't come together <laughs> in groups of over a hundred i'm like i did not remember that you could only like, have kind of cool. trios of musicians like you yeah. just could not have orchestras because it's like ah oh, too many people that would be mm-hmm. terrible like man that's so cool and then you know it doesn't matter but mm-hmm. but i mean like like it's fine that the world advanced but yeah like the cultural aspects is a, a lot diminished in the later books and mm-hmm. it's hard to see how these things both advance because like the plot is scaling up drastically in these things uh but you you do lose a bit. Hmm. Yeah. And I've seen people um, describe uh, Stormlight as well as having a lot of breadth to it, but not always that much depth to it, because yeah. there's a lot there, but like we're missing a lot of stuff when you look at like going back into history. And this kind of felt like the same thing, like we're expanding a lot outwards. We're just not going very deep with a lot of it. It must just be how Brandon likes to world build. So it's like oh, kind of a and there's something thing. wrong with that. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. the yeah. choice Which that he's is decided to make. Interesting because like one of like Sanderson's laws of magic is like to like is to do like depth versus the breadth. 
Oh. Mm. I, I, I think I wanna... for magic, Brandon does that better. Like he does go yeah. in depth on a few things rather than super broad things. Stormlight's an exception, of course. Oh yeah, it's Anderson's third law. Expand on what you have already before you add something new. That's pretty funny. Mm. So yeah, and like these are also like general like writing advice he gives. So it's interesting that like he's very good about that with magic, less so with culture. No. I also think the Krell were much more compelling antagonists here. Uh, like, I do think mm-hmm. in the later mm. series, like, the humans being, like, the conquerors was very interesting. Uh, and so I mm. do really like that historical aspect. But man, there, there's just something lost when, like, humanity is not this desperate like it is in this book it's like no if they get a bomb our society is literally like completely destroyed we will just have to hide in caves forever if the apparatus is destroyed uh and like ah oh, man brandon has said that he wrote this book and then outlined the sequels and i would just say that that feels very apparent <laughs> yeah. uh, because this this book has such a different feel like there's similarities in the later books but i don't know that desperation the dread uh intention um the isolation the isolation really. yeah mm-hmm. for sure it, 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 it's what i really like about skyward now granted once spencer solves those problems uh, yeah the next books are going to be different but the, the next books they feel even more <laughs> different because spencer's teleporting into alien societies right so yeah actually going off of that and kind of linking back a little bit to the culture conversation i was thinking a little bit about the the ending of this book and the way that they treat people who have the defect and they've tried to hide it all this time and they've basically treated her family as an outcast um because of it and i'm just surprised i know it's a ya series so i'm not actually surprised but i'm surprised (laughs) that they just accepted it and moved on and like that there was no backlash or anything about this all coming to light and they just were able to get over prejudices and keep going i guess and it it does make sense in terms of again as a ya series that's kind of what tends to happen but it felt less realistic the more i thought about it that there was no consequences to spencer coming out to everyone with having cytonic powers and it suddenly just being this good thing for them when it's been this bad thing for decades i think part of that is that they did like she did save alta base like it was assumed mm. that like they were in the blast radius like yeah we're gonna save igneous um and like everybody down below but like we're all dead it's like oh we're not gonna die okay we like this <laughs> And then I think a lot of the people in the know who know, knew she had the defect was like, oh, she's going to betray us. Like, oh, wait, she didn't betray us. Like, their credibility went down. Mm-hmm. My impression is that, like, yeah, there was this longstanding dispute over this <laughs> defect. Spencer won. <laughs> Ironsides completely is like, yeah, you screwed up real bad. And without Ironsides, it's just like, well, I mean, we have the awesome person with magical powers and her super robot. So, y- yeah, I mean, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> right. Yeah. And well, also it- figuring out the truth of what happened with Chaser of like, oh, no, he didn't just like turn evil. It's like they were ri- literally like projecting images into his brain. He thought you were all dead. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't actually betray you. But like, oh, hey, my ship's cool and protects me from that. So you don't have to worry. But I I really think the tension is is what really makes this book stand out. Like almost is it every time they flew on screen, someone got injured or killed or it's like almost every single time. Almost, I think the first time they all make it back safe. Oh, that's true. In that one where oh, that. That's 
still hilarious that they flew day one of flight school. That was some YA implausibility there, just I'm like, yeah. seriously? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, sure. So th- there's, you know, some YA tropiness here, but... There's also the... Um the battle where Ned's brothers die. Yeah. No one in Skyward Flight actually dies or gets injured in that one. In Skyward Flight, at least. Yeah, but but it's still brutal and Ned leaves. Out, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, but he doesn't get injured while flying. True. But there, there's consequences of flying, mm. right? Uh, yeah, there's and, consequences of flying. And yeah. it, it feels like the later books, Mbot is just super overpowered and Spencer is super overpowered compared with everyone else. And Brandon sort of needs to like deal with that. Yeah, so eh, Sp- yeah. Spencer just turned out to be too good, and so did Mbot. But it was really cool, Mbot being super overpowered in this finale, even without Destructors. It, it was it was really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something about the countdown and Cytonic hyperdrive engaged, like, hell yeah, oh, it's so good. Yep. Yeah. Especially if you're listening to the audiobook, that scene's delivery is amazing in the audiobook. For some favorite moments, uh, Hurl dying and Cobb being so furious. Mm. That was delicious. It's like, Cobb, he doesn't... Yeah, he's grumpy. Also, hilarious, this whole book. 10 out of 10. Love Cobb. Uh, in this mm. book. Just him just screaming at them. Eject. You need to eject. Oh, brutal. I love it yeah. so much. That's up there. And like, juxtaposing that with like the scene like earlier on where Spencer overhears... like one of like the other flight instructors like oh yeah don't eject like just control the landing mm-hmm. and it shows like Cobb cares about the people yeah not about the whole war effort he cares about his students yep and i love the bit right at the end where she does control the landing and she has the thought that like the two points where she was in a crash the one where she was able to control the landing, she wasn't trying to save a ship for the DDF. She wasn't trying to even really save herself. She knew that she had to do this for other people, otherwise they would die. And it was for the right reasons that she was trying to do it, whether she succeeded or not. Yeah, so good. What, what other favorite moments? I, I do love the shipyard battle. Mm. Oh man, the shipyard battle. That's yeah, so that's pretty brutal. Yeah. Like it, it has to be Grand Grand like talking about her mother and like th- the story of the mutiny. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's it's really cool. cool. I kind of forgot yeah. about the mutiny, honestly, until Jess reminded me a few weeks ago before <laughs> reading this. Is like, what? The mutiny? I'm like, oh man, I, I totally forgot about this. I forget about the mutiny. <laughs> like, I'm fascinated about this mutiny, man. I want to know so much about it. Right. We had like a 30 minute conversation we last did, night about did. this mutiny. <laughs> like, it, 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 it is very fascinating because it's like, it's like, where does power truly lie? It's like, yeah, the captain of the ship could do could say anything like they wanted but at the end of the day like it was the grand grand's mother that actually decided where the ship went yeah yeah that grand grand was excellent oh i think just all their favorite thing just all the character work like i was really Mm -hmm. surprised like Mm -hmm. you got to know all of the people in Skyward Flight well enough. Like, I mean, Morning Tide died, but you know, like th- th- there, yeah. there were hints of that where it's like, yeah, this mm-hmm. seed could blossom and then Brandon just ruins it and is brutal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the scene where like Spencer realizes like, oh, like she doesn't understand our language super well. Yeah. And then like going forward, like there are scenes where it's like, like she goes over and like helps explain things mm. and then she dies <laughs> i think if it had just been the scene where spencer's like oh she doesn't understand english properly like that's not her native language i think if it had just been that it wouldn't have been enough but it's brandon planting those damn little extra seeds of spencer like connecting with morning tide to try and help her that's what does it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the character work is fantastic because it's very easy with a chorus style book where there is, you know, you've got that main character, but you've still got 
uh, quite a few crew or whatever, it's very mm-hmm. easy for all of the crew to be the, their own. But you get like the fact that Amp, uh, whatever. I listened to the Arch Hero. Yeah, I still can't <laughs> say he has called Amphisbena. Yeah. Stupid two headed dragon thing, like Cobb says. Yeah. <laughs> Although Cobb does eventually learn how to say it, which is pretty funny as well. Yeah. But, you know, the fact that he's a know it all and it comes across, and the fact that Kimmelin is, you know, the cute little, oh, bless your stars. Like, she always reminds me of a Southern Belle. Oh, yeah, 100%. I, but... I think that's her. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Love Kimlin. Her. I think Kimlin's probably my favorite of the. Well, of she's the like the first one. Oh. That's Spencer. Yes, she is. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I guess no, this Rig. Well, there's Rig. He doesn't count. They're, like... lo- they're long term friends. That's That doesn't count. <laughs> and like technically, Jorgen shows up first, like during the test scene. But like Kimlin is like. Like the first important one. Like, yeah. yeah. That like she makes a meaningful connection with. Yeah. If we're talking about uh, favorite scenes, uh, Kimmelin shooting the connection between the bomber and the bomb and mm. dropping it. But like the scene just before it, not to get too much into character work, but like Spencer talking to Kimmelin and like drawing it back to that first conversation that they had of the advice Kimmelin gives to Spencer. And that's how she does it. So good. Yes. It makes me cry every time. That, that, that whole ending, that like that yeah. part, the Cytonic hyperdrive, M-Bot overriding. Yeah, oh, so good. <laughs> and like Kimmelin's whole thing, like being the sniper is like another kind of embarrassment for Ironsides, I think. Because like her whole deal is like, okay, like we're just going to churn out as many pilots as we can. They're going to be cookie cutters of each other. Like we have like set ways of doing things like, Rather than like pilots specializing at what they're good at. Yeah. And like, I mean, that's the way to win a war. You get a little bit of that with like the fact that there are scouts versus a little bit, pilots, for sure. but not as much as like Spencer is talking about with like, you know, the whole, well, for, put somebody forward to be the target and then have the sniper take him out and, you know, the plans that she puts together that. I'm sad that we don't get a chance to see that because that's one thing this book sets up is Spencer becoming like a genius in the military. And then instead she just pops up to yep, who knows where in the universe. And yep. <laughs> yep. yeah, I am sad that we don't get to see Spencer kind of grow into who they set her up to be in this book. It makes me think that Cog might have had a hand in like bringing Kimlin into the DDF, like going off what you were saying, Ian, about how Einstein really does just want like the same person 50 billion times. And like to an extent, mm. Cobb is like falling into that trap as well. But if Einstein is pushing that, then she's not really going to be the one who's like going for like the sniper pilot people and bringing them to the DDF to do sniper piloting. I can see Cobb like specifically pushing to get. Kimmelin into his class. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Thank you for watching. You can find us at 17thshar.com for all the news, discussion, theories, and fun you could ever want. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud. You can leave us a review on iTunes. You can subscribe on YouTube, and you can also support us on Patreon. See you next time. Bye. 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 It's not Sharkast. No cause for you. Weird. It's weird, man. No, you don't get them on Secrets and Stained Glass either.